Arsenal come streaming forward now in surely what will be their last attack. A good ball by Dixon, finding Smith. But Thomas charging through the midfield. Thomas, it's up for grabs now. Thomas, right at the end. Hello and welcome to Gooners in the USA. Mike. I don't know if we should do like an intro sound of like a tumbleweed going past. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's been uh, just a fun, fun week. I, I so fun, in fact. I noticed that uh, that you, you've been up to your old tricks again, Andy, with our Twitter account <laughs> last night. Yeah, sometimes I get really bored, and since the. Um... Since there's a lot of Manchester United talk, I like to, as you know, I like to troll Man United fans from once every once in a while. So, yeah, I had some fun. Um, one guy really bit, and he then figured out that I was trolling him, and he thought it was funny. So, had a good time. Well, that, but but you're you're also uh, oh, I'm you're also promising your- people baconators as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're, you're promising me buying like baconator meals for people and feeding them to them mama bird style, yes. which uh, disgusting. Like, in, in other news, we we're now down to one listener. <laughs> Thank you, Joey Murphy. <laughs> Joey Murphy actually signed up three accounts when he heard that that, that was going to happen. But let's uh, yeah, let, let's let's brighten everyone's mood by bringing in our guest today. We're we're very very excited, uh, Andy, about our guest mm-hmm. today. Looking forward to her visit for uh, for some time. Amy Lawrence, welcome to the podcast. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. And and here's here's my intro. Uh, I hope I don't get anything wrong here, but uh, Amy is a outstanding football writer for both the Guardian and the Observer for over twenty years. So you started like as a nine year old. Was it a prodigy prodigy type of situation? Uh, you know, you're, you're, this is a great start. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, the, there's nothing. What is it? Um, flattery is the best form of flattery. <laughs> Yeah, Frequent no. broadcasts on radio and television, BBC and others, uh, accomplished author of many books, including at least three about the arsenal. Um, and obviously the most crowning achievement in my eyes anyway, the epic 89, the film, which if you haven't heard of it yet, you must be living under a rock. Um, but, uh, Amy, you, you uh, as you may know, you collaborated with Lee Dixon to produce and feature in, uh, in what I've heard is just a spine tingling hour and a half documentary about the greatest year of my sports fans life. Cause we have to make this about me, obviously 1989. So welcome to the podcast, Amy. Thank you so much. I think after an intro like that, I can just like let you guys talk for the next hour. <laughs> <moment. laughs> we're not going to defeat the purpose. Though. Yeah, we're not going to let that happen. So, <laughs> so on the pod, we like to get to know our guests well. So, before we jump into the film and, and possibly the the last two matches, Amy, tell us about your affinity with Arsenal. How it began? Is it true you've been a supporter since you were six? That's right. Yeah, I um, you know, I, I was I was a child of the seventies and um. It wasn't that common to have girls who were interested in football uh, or even lightly, never mind being fanatical um, in that era in, in the UK. And I got taken to a game when I was six by my best friend at the time, dad, who had three season tickets in the old West End. And he wanted to take his daughter and he thought he was a little bit reluctant because he's thinking, what if she hates it? You know, girls aren't really into football. I better take a friend, you know, and that friend was me. So it was quite a stroke of fate because I actually grew up in a, uh, my uh, um, immediate family in the house are QPR fans, my dad and my brother. Um, so I got taken off to this game at Highbury and it was a kind of classic fever pitch moment where you walk through the, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and the, the, the kind of colour and, and noise and atmosphere uh, just blew me away. And I can't pretend I was an expert on the elf side trap or any of that stuff <laughs> at the age of six. Um, uh, so I didn't really know what was going on, except I just knew I loved it. It was kind of a guttural connection. Um, Theo's how old and he's still not an expert on the elf side trap. So. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I went home and my dad said, oh, you know, how did you like the football? And I said, that's great. Can I go to Arsenal next week? And he said, well, I'll take you to QPR. And I went, mm, no, can I go to Arsenal next week? So <laughs> we had a kind of ongoing situation while I was a kid where I would quite, you know, quite often go to one game a year, which was QPR against Arsenal, because I was quite insistent uh, about who I supported from moment one. Um, and I grew up in North London and it just, 
I was just one of those nerdy kids that loved kind of facts and stats and cutting things out and sticking them down and collecting them. And I, I you know, I was really obsessed from quite a young age. And uh, most people around me thought it was weird because that wasn't what girls did. Uh, but I didn't really care. And I guess I was rewarded for my weirdness as I yeah. got older. And um, all that kind of assembled uh, infatuation and knowledge and passion uh, kind of somehow landed me um, a job right about football. But, yeah, I was a, a, I, I guess probably my um, – where 89 became a big part of of my life was that was probably – I was 17 by then. And uh, that was when you, – you have that kind of rite of passage sometimes as a football fan where, you know, you, you almost have to chalk off certain milestones. Um, and I was kind of going home and away by then. And, you know, at that age, it was quite exciting. There was still a kind of a vibrancy and an energy and to an extent, a little bit of danger and aggro or going to footballs at, at, at that kind of time. Oh, yeah. um, football was not that popular, you know, you outside of people who love football. You were either in it or other people looked down on you, you know. Because well, we, ban- we were banned from Europe at the time. Absolutely. And, and Heisel was just yeah. a few years before. I mean, it, the the whole thing was kind of in a... Uh, oh, it was a complicated time to watch football. Crowds were quite low. I mean, you know, we're looking at... We're complaining nowadays about crowds being down at Premier League matches and empty seats at the Emirates. By no means are, are, is that an, an ex- Arsenal-exclusive problem. You look around a lot of games, if it, if it's a modest-ish fixture... Um, mm. It's, you know, you see a lot of empty seats around, you know, around. And that wasn't the case, you know, perhaps five or ten years ago where most grounds were a sellout most of the time. Um, but back in the kind of 80s, crowds were, were low um, because it wasn't this kind of big societal thing where everybody, or it seemed like loads of people were interested in football. Or even if you weren't, if you came and visited a uh, uh, a city from uh, outside, you'd want to go go and see the football ground or go and see a match. And this is relatively new. Uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't a tourist attraction that it is no, today. No, absolutely not. I think if a tourist turned up at a match in the 80s, they would have thought, what the hell am I doing here? And people would have looked at him them as if to say, what the hell are you doing here? So the vibe was very different then. Anyway, I've gone off on a massive tangent. But well, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's no. fantastic. And, and it's a time in my life that, you know, that was just, it was my coming of age living in London for, from age 15 to 17 and happening to be from 88 to 90. Wow. Uh, I had that fever pitch moment as well. I mean, that's why I'm still here today. I mean, I, I don't mean on the earth. I mean, as, as an Arsenal supporter, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is a lucky time to be there. And, and, um, and that's one reason why I'm looking forward to this film so much. Well, I think there was, there was an energy that was going on there. And I think that's one of the things again, and I'm, I'm a terrible one for a bit of nostalgia. And, you know, we all get a bit like this when we get a bit older where you look back at you, you know, your childhood moments and, Obviously, you're always going to think it was better when you were a kid than any than at any other era. Um, but I do think that the, that one of the things that I miss about football today is the the connection that I think was a lot easier between fan, player, manager, club. The whole kind of thing when you were in it, you felt very connected to the whole thing. And I think now that's quite difficult to replicate. But if you went to games around around then if you kind of just hung around you'd see players and you could have a chat with them or you might see the manager or y- 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 other fans y- y- you know people didn't argue with one another in the way that might sometimes be the case nowadays because everyone was kind of in the same boat and everyone felt like they were part of something um the club really felt like it belonged to all of us whether yeah. you were a fan whether you were a player whether you worked in in, in the um uh, inside the club somewhere, uh, whether you were a steward, wh- whatever, you name it. It was. Well, it every- really did a lot more than it does today belong to yeah. all of us. So, I mean, obviously, the, it's, a, it's a huge, globalized, enormous, gigantic industry now. Um, multi millions of pounds, you know, all over the place, changing the landscape. Um, and for some, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. I'm, I, I, talking to you guys now, um, I think w- w- when it was the oh, my memory is terrible. When Arsenal came to the states, was that la- the summer before last? Yeah, it was uh, yeah, 2000. Some... 
2014 I, and 2016, I think. Yeah. I was there a couple of those games, and I found it quite, Im, quite moving, quite emotional to see how devoted and attached people were to the to the club and to the cause and how knowledgeable they were when obviously you live a long long way away from attending games in person you have to get up at funny hours of the day or night to watch it and I think there's a lot of people out there who are really snooty about you know fans from abroad and I think that's so far wide of the mark mm-hmm. it, yeah People who might use like uh, their Twitter pulpit to uh, to tear down people from other countries, perhaps <laughs> even. <laughs> uh, but actually seeing <laughs> with my own eyes and, and talking to people and seeing the efforts that they go to and the, the how much it's in their soul. Uh, and I, actually, I really found it refreshing because I thought that the general atmosphere was much, much more positive because it felt to me like the people there. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Ah. It's arson calling. Uh, um, okay, sorry. Do you need me to do that again? <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. Okay. okay um, uh, but I felt that there was so much more positive energy towards where, where you would, you, you, uh, I'm much more accustomed going to um, matches here. People getting, you know, getting on people's backs uh, quickly, uh, getting on players' backs or, or being quick to criticise and judge. And it felt to me that because um, the frequency on, uh, of being close to the club or close to the players is is not is not good for you guys, that yeah. there was such a natural tendency to to feel more positive and more encouraging. And I would say in general that's probably true, uh, but there's certainly a good share of of negativity from here. But the one thing that it that both the positive and the negative here in the U.S. have in common is just the level of passion is high. It's higher than ever. Um, you know, the passion positively, passion negatively. And, um, and, and I know months ago I invited you to come out to Gunnar Gras, which is, uh, one day, man, one day next year, next year. But the, uh, I mean, as it turns out, there's not even a match this year during it. And that, and, and it's still going to be the, the strongest attended, uh, American supporters club gathering and it, just to celebrate the arsenal, even though we're not playing. Um, it, it, it's, it's an example of exactly what you were talking about. And, and so you're, your passion for Arsenal, Arsenal was started at an early age and your, uh, your affinity for, for writing about Arsenal came to, to be in three different books, uh, covering most of what longtime Arsenal supporters will consider the high points of the last 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, it, I believe started with proud to say that name in 1997. Yeah, that's right. Uh, covering three decades of Arsenal, uh, did it, and, and I apologize. I have, I haven't read it yet. Uh, but it culminates in the 89 league win. Uh, I, I know you talked to just a who's who of, of Arsenal heroes and, and coaches like George Graham and Charlie George, David Seaman, Wrighty, Rocky, O'Leary. Um, you know, that is, is that pretty much the, the dark days up until 1989? Well, the time frame for that was, uh, was from 1970 to kind of, um, the, 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 mid nineties really. Um, it was, uh, the idea behind that book, which seems a long time ago now was, um, a kind of dream team idea where the publishers got hold of writers and said, okay, we'd like you to pick a dream team and interview each of the players and a manager involved in this dream team that you pick. And each of them has a, 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 a favorite game or, or a game associated with them. So you kind of telling a, a span of history, through the great players and the great matches. Some of the games were kind of left field choices. They weren't, you know, some of them were obviously matches where something was, a trophy was won or important moments like that. Others were slightly more random matches that just meant something at the time. Um, and it was nice to get, you know, the, t- the, the, the line of history, which in a way goes back to, you know, the, le- the 70, 71 era, um, that first double, the first cup, which preceded it, which was a, a game um, that those who were there recall as being stupendously important. And I kind of laugh now when people are almost a bit like, oh, so what if we win the Europa League? <laughs> um, and then you think back to in 1970 when Arsenal won their first European trophy. Um, it was a significant and gigantic milestone for the club. And again in 1994 when Arsenal beat Palmer to win the now defunct 
couple, couple of hours. hours. <sighs> Which would really be frowned on by people now, because crikey, that's not even the second best UFC Could you imagine? Like, the third, I mean, oh, the horror. You know what? That was one of the best days ever as an Arsenal, pl- uh, Arsenal fan. I also went to Copenhagen. I, I had three quarters of a, of a ground. People were absolutely off their faces with a combination of whatever was making them feel good about being there and enjoying the moment, plus the football and being in a final. It was a real proud moment for the club. They played against a, what was then a brilliant Palmer team who were probably more talented than the Arsenal team on the day. And it was a classic smash and grab, 1-0 to the Arsenal. And it was a, you know, if you couldn't enjoy a moment like that, there's really no point following sport. So I think that, you know, things are not great at the moment or everybody's entitled to be critical and and have their judgment. But sometimes a reality check is no bad thing. And I think it's a bit like people are, are unhappy at the moment. And I think everybody understands that. But the three FA Cups in four seasons... Did people not enjoy those finals? No, that did, there was the the most enjoyable and some of the only enjoyable times uh, in is recent it, memory. If you can't enjoy it, what what is wrong with you? It's quite an interesting existential question, though, as a fan. Is it worth a bit of a crappy season where you're really disappointed quite a lot and you're frustrated and things aren't as good as you should be for those moments of joy? That lots and lots of other clubs who might be quite pleased with their season but don't have a cup final and, and silverware to, to cherish at the end of it. It helps that it's at the end of it. (laughs) That you measure that, I'm sorry I'm going on again, but you measure that against the very, very simple but important question, are we as good as we're, are we doing everything we can to be the best that we can be? And I think any sportsman is entitled to ask that question as well. Mm -hmm. And there is a really kind of complex relationship between the, did you enjoy the cup finals and is that enough question? And is Arsenal doing everything it can to be the best that it can be given its circumstances question? And it's like the two things rub against each other and it's difficult. Yeah, it, it's a quandary that we're all facing right now. And, and, and so the second book, proud to say that name, uh, which, uh, oh no, sorry, that was the first book. The second book about the Invincibles, which is where the next movie obviously has to come from, especially after yesterday. Now that we know that they're they're still the only invincibles uh, of the Premier League era, anyway, uh, to deep dive into the players and and the psyches uh, that led to what we know after yesterday is is, is you know is going to be uh, still Arsenal's thing, and then the the Wenger Revolution, twenty years of Arsenal, with Stuart McFarlane, who we we hope to have on uh, someday as well, because his his experiences and and uh, access to the team is is just unparalleled uh, as their chief phot- photographer, but. Uh, I would say that book is is probably one for those who want to refresh and and regain their their positive memories of happier days with Arsene Wenger. Mm. And that brings us to 89 the film, which uh, was released in November in the UK uh, to much fanfare and and excitement. I I watched uh, jealously and eagerly uh, the, the the interviews from the premiere and. Uh, and it's being released here in the US tomorrow, uh, Tuesday the 16th. So what's this movie about? I, I, I'm confused. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Okay, so um, what we realised we had with this movie is unbelievable drama and unbelievable feeling and emotion. And I think that the the, the two things when you try when you sit down with any story and you have essentially a blank piece of paper and you say, okay, how are we going to tell this story the best that we can? There's obviously a countless different ways that you could, you could do that. And I think there was a couple of things that became apparent once we started to look at all the material we had. And one of which is the original idea was, okay, you, you know, you start off by building up, to what, what was going on that season, what was it like in the 80s, who were all these guys. You're getting people interested in, in, in caring about why you want, why it's interesting if they win this big match or not at the end of it all. Um, but the, once we started to cut the film, it was just obvious that the actual match itself, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and longer and stretched and more detailed because the kind of anatomy of the, the game is completely compelling. So we sort of compressed a little bit of the preamble, if you like, and it's about 
getting to that moment where, okay, it's the 26th of May, 1989. For those who don't know the story, <laughs> uh, it, it, I've told um, it about 150,000 times on the podcast. <laughs> I'll, I'll defy anyone to, to come up with, uh, you know, a more, you know, a much more dramatic ending to a league season ever because essentially it was, it was a league and a cup final all rolled into one because it was, it was eyeball to eyeball, soul to soul, toe to toe. You know, one of these teams wins a league, the other one doesn't and they were against each other. On the last day. And it wasn't even supposed well, to be the last day. No, it was supposed not to be Hillsborough. previously, of course. And, and it, it was a really weird thing because 90 of the 92 professional clubs in English football had all finished all their matches. And there was just one game left over. And it happened to involve the teams in first and second in the league out of 92. And the result on the night determined which one of those teams takes the prize. Plus, you have to factor in, as you mentioned, Hillsborough. There was a unique environment and atmosphere that night. I've not been to a game before or since that felt quite like that one did. And the the way everybody in football was feeling at that time, you know, it's quite difficult to articulate. Even all these years later, it was a very, very profound moment that obviously it's something that is connected highly with Liverpool. But if you were just a football fan in those times, or you loved the game, or you were involved in it in any way, it it hit deep. It really hit deep. Um, and and, and it, it, it was the kind of... It was, it, it, was in, it was in the air constantly that night. And, I mean, I still... I watch those pictures of, of the match, and it was strange, because I remember somebody saying to me not, not so long ago, as an Arsenal fan, didn't you feel like you shouldn't win the league that night because of Hillsborough? Right, right, right. And that's quite that's quite an intense question to Absolutely. even find, wrap your head around, really. So, and go on. Sorry. No, 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 no. Please finish. Sorry. <laughs> I was gonna, I'm not even sure what the answer to that is. I mean, I, I of course, everybody wanted to win. Um, you know, it'd been 18 years since Arsenal won the league, and it, all it did was just make it really complex because you were like. Are we supposed to feel like this? Is it okay? And it was kind of in the in the back of your minds because, like all these things, you sort of have to crack on. Um, once Liverpool started playing football again and the rest of football picked up and tried to carry on as best they could, you get on with what's in front of you as best you can. Um, but it was it was it was it was deep for everybody. It was really really deep, and it remains that way. So how did the collaboration and development for the film happen? Did you sit down with Lee Dixon and, and think of the idea together? Or how did it, how was it born? And then did you get the corporation from the club right away? Did they allow you to just use footage from the club? Or did you have to find everything that, you know, that's public domain or work with a certain TV channel to get that? How did it all come about? Well, it started with um, a friend of mine uh, called Adam who went to the game in 89. He was 15 at the time and I think missed one of his exams or something and to get a ticket as a whole great story that he's got. And like anybody who was there, it's it's a big moment in your life and it, it stays big. And he sent me an email one day saying, hey, there's a few football films been coming up doing quite well. It seems strikingly obvious that 89 is such an incredibly good subject for one. And I didn't even need to finish this email. I was like, wow, this, this is amazing. We've got to do this. Um, and I uh, ended up having some conversations through various people. And we soon we got a, a, a team together with a director who was a friend of a friend. And then the next thing is, OK, so how do we get this thing made? And the first person that I wanted to call was Lee. And I'm in a very privileged position to know uh, quite a lot of those guys from the team from that era. Um, uh, but Lee, he's he's a very special guy, and I just sense that he would be the perfect first port call to talk about. Do we think people will be interested? What do they, what do we think they'll want to do? How's it going to work? What can we achieve? And we, the director and myself and exec producer, met up with Lee first. And we sat and started talking to him and it was like a 
went into a kind of real long two hour conversation. And at the end of it, we all looked at each other and it was like, look, we've got to ask Lee. Lee said, what do you want me to do? He said, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And we were like, look, you can do whatever you want to do. And he was like, look, I want, I, I want to do as much as I can. I want to be as involved as I can. And it just seemed completely natural to bring him on board properly. In other words, we don't just want an interview, interview from you and then thanks very much. And he became in, essential. Uh, he was, he's an executive producer, which he loves that title. Uh, <laughs> can't get enough of it. But he wanted to learn about making films and threw himself into it with a fantastic commitment of energy. Um, and he was available to consult constantly throughout the process. He was involved in how the story was developing. He was obviously very important in terms of picking up the phone to other members of the team and, and getting them to be as enthusiastic as we were about collaborating. Um, and he was that authenticity about, you know, having that inside knowledge of everything that was going on at that time. Um, so that was brilliant. And then we started to, you know, the great thing was the, the majority of the lads, as soon as they got a phone call, they were straight away only too happy to, to, to be involved and share those memories. And what was happening when we were interviewing the players was that we'd sit down and just start off and you talk about George Graham and you talk about the 80s and you talk about some of the things that were happening leading up to 89. And then two things happened that were remarkable. The first was that if you, when, when the subject of Hillsborough came up, the deep emotion in the players was apparent. And that's something that was very important for the film because it was a complicated bit to get right and it was absolutely crucial to get that right. And the players helped us to try and get that right because their emotion was real and genuine and very, very authentic um, and from the heart. And uh, the other thing that happened is when once we started to talk about the game and the 26th of May 1989, it was like, it was the same with every player. It was as if they got plugged into a kind of extra electric socket and something <laughs> changed. And you see, it, it, it was like... Sitting there doing the interviews, there was this ungodly silence, like intensity. And you didn't even want to breathe or blink because everything just went up a massive notch because they were talking about basically the best moment of their professional lives. Yeah. You know, you're not just chit chatting about, OK, what was, you know, what was it like training under George Graham and blah, blah, blah. How good were Liverpool? And, you know, it's like, let me talk to you about the, the single moment that is above all else in your chosen field. And it was the same for all of them. So there was this energy that was kind of kicking off big time and we thought we've got to capture that. The other thing was, as you mentioned, getting the footage. Um, and the real steal was somebody discovered uh, a, a camera that had been run that night, which was pitch side next to the dugouts. And I've heard about this. I cannot wait to see it. <laughs> fast. But it, actually makes you feel like you're on the pitch. It's just amazing that the camera work gets a bit fuzzy and in and out, you're kind of in and out of legs and feet and kind of the focus is changing. But the energy of it is, wow, you can feel the tackle crunching in on the ball or the player going flying or you can see somebody eyeballing someone else and the look on their face. And it was it, it was great because it just gave us that depth. And it's not just, oh, look, here's the footage that we've all seen before. Um, so that was that was which, great which, which frankly, and, and by today's standards, it makes it look less intense than it might actually have been because of the, you know, the, the picture quality, the color quality. Everything is, you know, is 1980s as opposed to what we're seeing now. Cool. And it could it could almost dampen it, if not for the knowledge of what it all meant. And now with the the footage of of from pitch side, I just I, I can't wait to see it. I told you before the podcast, uh, Amy, that, you know, th this game and this year holds a very special place in my heart. I mean, the, the intro to our podcast, which you didn't hear it because it gets added in during post production, which, which is what I call when Andy punches a bunch of buttons for five minutes and then it ends up on iTunes. Uh, but it's the, the Brian Moore audio, uh, from that famous call, which just make every time I hear it, it makes me tingle. Um, Mark I mean, I was, Bible was the master, you know. Uh, the absolute dawn for me of, of commentary. I mean, when you listen back to his commentary of, of that night, 
so many of the lines are like absolute poetry. He understood what it was about. Oh, yeah, yeah. A night of chilling simplicity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Ooh. So uh, they, I, I hear there's footage of, of you know, of, of the North Bank and, and the fans during those very uh, nervy weeks before the, the game, the the loss against Derby, the tie, against, the, the draw against Wimbledon, mm. um, I, and I'm hoping that's true. I'm going to freeze frame it because I was in those in those uh, crowds I suffering, I suffering. And- myself. Well, somebody sent some. We, I had to make a made a Twitter appeal at some point in the making of this because one thing that's again it's a big contrast of today's football experience compared to then was you know how few people took cameras. Obviously, you know at a similar event today you're going to have a whole bunch of people with, you know, taking live video and, and you know, pictures, whatever you want. Everybody can do it at the touch of a button on their own phone. It doesn't need to be any special equipment. If memory serves, I don't even think we were allowed to take cameras into the ground then. It was quite, you know, you had to be a bit naughty. To- I was too busy smuggling a, a pint of scotch and a Diet Coke into the ground. Oh, <laughs> so I wasn't even thinking sense. about cameras. But I don't, I don't, I mean, I didn't, I didn't take a camera that night. And when I think back to it, I was like, why on earth would I not have taken a camera with me? And, uh, uh, you know, but we had very, there's very little footage of the Arsenal fans that night from the game. Because even, even the, when the game was broadcast, and there's some lovely little details about the broadcast, the game for kind of aficionados of nostalgia, but, um, there was, there's, there's not a lot, they didn't take much footage of the Arsenal fans. There's a few kind of long, distance shots it's not like today where they're homing in on people and showing well, them and that and that bit at the end where, where it's just absolute mayhem yes uh, it's famous as well but yes, indeed. but but you know the 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 i don't the, we spoke to the guy who was producing the the live um uh broadcast that night and this was one of the first years of of live broadcasts on 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 uh on british tv of of first division games as they were called then so it was all quite new and they went, they, there was hardly any preamble. They went to the game about 10 minutes before it started and then they went off air about 10 minutes after it finishes. So there's very little in terms of post-match interviews or footage of, you know, the dressing room. There's little tiny bits here and there, but it's not a lot of it compared to what you might get today. And the guy who was supposed to be the uh, expert and the producer couldn't even remember who it was, didn't go. So they had no pundit. So... It's the biggest game that, you know, one of the biggest games ever. And this guy, what are we going to do? And he was hanging around by the director's box at Anfield. And uh, Bobby Robson, who's the England manager of the time, uh, appeared and went in. And he was just going to watch the game. And he went up to him and said, Bobby, please, we haven't got a pundit. Can you help me? Will you come and watch it with us? And Bobby went, oh, you know what? I just want to watch the game. And. Anyway, he, he allowed his arm to be twisted because he was a nice guy. And Bobby, uh, Bobby Robson stepped in to be the pundit, completely unplanned. Oh, jeez. Which is just, you know, it's sweet because it's kind of impossible. And the other thing that's brilliant is that when you watch the footage again and there's a little yellow clock that comes on with about three or four minutes to go of the 90 or whatever it is. I think it was five minutes to go. That was the first time that a clock had ever been shown in a live match ever. <laughs> And, there, and the guy, the producer, recalled the conversation he had with uh, others he was working with, saying, should we put a cross up? Someone's saying, oh, don't be ridiculous, it'll look awful. You know, and he said, look, we've got to put this up here. You know, people have got to know what time is it. And somebody just went, sod it, let's do it. And they put the clock up. And um, so you see that ticking clock running through to the, to the, uh, to the 90 minutes. Um which and adds adds to the drama, of course. Period details that seem, you know, we all stuff we're used to now that was very different. And the other thing that was amazing is the referee and the linesman. You will remember the first goal on the night was disputed, mm-hmm. and uh, the referee went over to speak to his linesman um, to try and make sure he got the decision right to buy himself a bit of time. And the Liverpool players were all surrounding him. Everyone thought it was going to be disallowed because it was Anfield and all that stuff. And the referee and the linesman had never met before that game and never saw each other after ever. <laughs> it was the only time they ever officiated a game together in their lives. You know, crazy. If it was Mike Dean, we we this movie wouldn't have happened. Let's just let's just be honest about it. <laughs> so on, we watch, 
it's a fa- it's a fascinating night. I, I I literally cannot wait for tomorrow. Uh, I'm gonna. My son is 15 now. Uh, well, he's almost 15. Uh, the age I was then, and um, I'm gonna force him to watch this movie with him. He's heard me talk about it over and over and over again. So have all my friends, most of which are not my friends anymore because I keep talking about this. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this is, I feel like it's a movie made for me and, and, and that's how every movie, everyone should feel about every movie, ideally. Yeah, I forgot to tell you I made it for you. Sorry. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, I, no. I, I was trying to drag that out of you without so much kind of saying it personally, but, uh, and, and that's why you maybe wait two months to, to see it legally here in the U S. So, uh, but no, it's, it's, um, it's, it should be available on all usual channels to buy a DVD and on down digital download. Um, you know, iTunes and so on and so forth. Well, we want, we want to uh, make sure to get to our, our user questions. We we would normally uh, kind of transition into discussing the games from this week, and and we'll we'll talk about those afterwards. And 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 if you've got to get back to work, we certainly will understand that. And and Andy and I can tackle the game on our own in our own special way. But uh, we want to make sure to. We, we had a, a probably five or six user questions. We call them user questions. It's stupid, but. Um, but uh, the first one is from Danny, the GFP from uh, Burke Camp Wonderland. Uh, we love Danny, and, and he had a question for you, which you've somewhat answered. Uh, um, he wants to know what you were doing that famous night of May 26, 89. Uh, but he added a comment, which is, I think she's younger than me. I'm 47, but I was sat on my Arsenal duvet cover with, with my mate, a Liverpool fan, watching the match on, his, on, on my bedroom JVC television. And and I, that's a lot more than we needed to know about Danny's teenage love life, personally. But the question is still valid. We're, you've obviously said today you were there, but were you there as a supporter, as a journalist? Uh, were you working, or, or was it pleasure? Well, I'm glad to say that I am marginally younger than Danny, uh, <laughs> but not by much, which made me 17 at the time. So I was uh, I was still a schoolgirl, and in fact, it was my last day of school. Um, and I went in with my, uh, went into school with a, with a banner that, uh, my friend and I had painted in her dad's garage on an old bed sheet, uh, with a big cannon and it said, Arsenal, we're proud of you. And the message was supposed to kind of convey, Hey, you know what? Even if you right. would make it, you know, what, what a fantastic, um, go that the, the team had had that season. And, uh, um, I remember. I will spare you the gory details of what I was wearing in those days, uh, <laughs> from the point of view. But it wasn't pretty. Um, and me and my mate, who I'd kind of persuaded to be an Arsenal fan with me, um, we bunked off school at about eleven o'clock in the morning. And when uh, what was nice is that we were kind of everybody sort of knew, and we were sent off with real good wishes and like, oh, good luck. And there's it's that thing that is touched upon in Fever Pitch where you re- there really was this sense that everybody in North London, everybody knew, everybody was watching, everybody was interested, which wasn't how football was then, but it was a special event. And people were wishing us luck. Um, even the teachers, who probably should have said, where the hell do you think you're going? <laughs> uh, kind it, was of, a, it was a Friday night, though. Well, yeah, but it was our last day of school. And they kind of patted us on the head and said, go on, good luck, off you go. And um, we got a lift down to Highbury to meet the coaches. There was 26 coaches in convoy on the travel club that uh, that went up there and we got caught in this horrible traffic jam, which meant most of us missed the kickoff, but we did get there uh, by about 10 minutes into the game. And I was in that little corner that you see going bonkers uh, at the, in the, in one of the shots of the fans <laughs> celebrating towards the end. So um, it's, you know, incredibly meaningful for me because it was my favorite ever football moment. So we have a question from uh, Tiffany Campo, who joined us last week representing the Guna Gals group here in the U.S. Do you think it's a good idea to sign someone like Aubameyang at this point in the season at his age and our place in the table? Good question, Tiffany. Um, look, I think we have two issues. We have short-term crisis management uh, or firefighting, or making the best of a complex situation, and we have a long-term, hopefully, plan somewhere uh, to try and kind of improve the things that are not quite up to scratch in terms of the way the club is being run. Um, 
I don't know how much is achievable this January, whether it's just short term or whether there's or whether they are a, whether they want to look more long term. Uh, I guess if the Alexis Sanchez story ends unhappily um, with a move to somewhere frightful from an Arsenal point of view, then you've got to do something fast unless you just want to throw the season. Uh, if you've got, look, it's really hard. I mean, let's say hypothetically speaking that there's a, a Kylian Mbappe out there who nobody has quite discovered yet and you think this guy is going to be, you know, the one who everybody is going to be cooing over in six months or a year's time. But he's going to cost this much and we're going to be able to do it in the summer. If you've got that option, then you have a decision to make. If you haven't got that option, and I'd be surprised if uh, if Arsenal have, then you just get the best thing you can get your hands on right now if you're losing the player of Alexis's stature. And if that man is considered to be Aubameyang, you've got to go again. I agree that he's on the slightly old side. I think he's a bit like Alexis, got some elements of his personality that could go either way. That's the thing. He could be, he could turn up and be uh, adored and and relish it and slot straight in, and everybody loves him. Or you could be looking at him in a few months' time uh, with body language or facial expressions or gestures. Not dissimilar to kind of the obvious frustration that Lacazette has at the moment, thinking, what am I doing here? Yeah. So it's all, a, it's all quite quite difficult. It's an interesting question. And, and I think when you look at the market, you know, we need a player that can come in and step up right away. If you are looking at replacing Alexis Sanchez and you bring in this Malcolm guy from France, the amount of pressure on this kid's shoulders. I mean, it's a Theo Walcott situation all over again. He's going to replace Thierry Henry. Malcolm's going to replace Alexis Sanchez. He's already starting off in the negative because our fan base is just so abusive at this point that you're almost wanting to bring in a name that can come in and make a difference. But he has a lot of off-the-field issues, and hopefully a new environment would hopefully change that for him. Tiffany did have a follow-up question. Um, who do you think will get him the ball the best? Do you reckon Jack is ready when he's not quite consistent in his targeting of passes? Um, we're seeing him still specifically at Chelsea pick up that, that, that ankle injury. He looked fine yesterday, but do you think he's the right person for a central midfield partnership with, with Jaka? Do we drop Jaka and maybe put Ramsey in and have Jack and, and Ramsey control that midfield? What are your thoughts there? My thoughts are, I, what, you know, if, if Arsenal are out there on the market at the moment looking for stuff, um, I mean, I, I, I've probably been like, really annoyingly banging this drum for quite some time but I've still been a little bit surprised that Arsenal haven't invested more in quality in central midfield in the power in central midfield in a little bit of physicality and running and somebody who can dominate in central midfield over these last two or three years I think that's been a real problem area getting balance in the midfield is just been something that uh, Arsene Wenger has tried various different combinations with, but not found the answer yet. Whether he has the answer anyway with the players at the club's current disposal is another question. I would say probably not. Um, I would, I've been saying for a while, and I would continue to say it, that Arsenal should be trying to get as quickly as possible the best central midfield player in terms of a power player that they can get their hands on. Uh, because I think if you can get someone to do Jack's running for him um, and take a little bit of the load off him in terms of the, the dirty side of the game and allow him to just be create, you know, he's always going to, he loves to tackle and that's not going to change, but he's got the best vision from central midfield and the best pass and the best qu- quickness and speed of making things happen from central midfield at the club. And I think if you're going to, value that and value the fact that he's someone who genuinely cares about this club mm. um, then try and build around him but he need, probably needs different personnel around him in order to allow that to, to best happen so we have a question from David Ziegler um, what is your favorite anecdote from your experience working with Ray Parler 
his autobiography and, and uh, David wants to, to mention that it's a fantastic read and you know, something about Ray that you enjoyed or remembered from the experience. Ray was brilliant. Um, utterly, utterly hilarious. I must admit, um, he's a complete one off and he loves telling a story. He's a master storyteller and his liking for jokes is spectacular. Have I got a favorite? I mean, I think, I think the anecdote that I, I absolutely adored because I thought it was classic him. Um, and I didn't really know it beforehand was the one he tells about the, uh, about his little binge that he has in the 2002 <laughs> season, uh, in between the, um, cup final and winning the league at Old Trafford, which was about five days later. And, uh, <laughs> He uh, was he up until three thirty in the morning, uh, well, partying the night before the game. <laughs> please, I think uh, he, he, he. What was so brilliant is he's got this kind of great sort of little boy being slightly naughty way about. I mean, he's also got a way of finding trouble where he doesn't really mean to, but it, you know, trouble always seems to sort of find him, and he just, it, it just it, it's as if he thinks, "How on earth does that happen?" But he. Yeah. Um, uh, he scored in the cup final and it was a huge deal to him because, uh, he'd grown up idolizing the FA Cup final, watching it religiously every year with his brothers, with the curtains closed and they'd have, you know, his mum would make sandwiches and they'd have juice and it was a big deal. And he scored a superb goal, uh, in that cup final against Chelsea. And they got, they flew to Cardiff from London, which is not very far, but that was obviously what they did. And when they went back onto the, um, onto the onto the plane, he asked the stewardess for a beer. And he was about to take a sip and Arsene Wenger came down the, the <laughs> aisle and said, uh Ray, no drinking. <laughs> and he went, Oh, so I've just scored in the cup final. And he went, Ray, no drinking. So a little bit reluctantly he gave the beer back. And he went down to the back of the uh plane a little bit later, Ray, where his family were, and one of his brothers had a beer and he said, Give us some of that beer. <laughs> Literally tap on the shoulder, Arsene Wenger. <laughs> if I see, if I see you having a, any a, a, any alcohol, that's a ten thousand pound fine, whatever it was. You know, Jesus, that's an expensive beer. So he gave it back, and Wenger said to him, "If you, you know, you're not you're not to drink, uh, because we've got we can win the league on Wednesday at Old Trafford, and you know that's the focus. After that, you can drink." So Ray went out that night with his girlfriend and was going to have a quiet night and it ended up being some gigantic bender. <laughs> he went into training the following day and uh, and he was still, I think, half paralytic and was trying to avoid arson because I think his breath smelt of booze and he was obviously looking a bit worse for wear. And he also went and pretended to do a few stretches in the gym. He'd like shown his face, which was the important thing, and then cleared off and managed to not see Arsene. And on his way home, he stopped by a little place that he knew where some of his friends were, opened the door, and everyone went, Way! You know, they'd, Oh, I had money on you to score in the cup final. Let me buy you a drink. And he said, Like, five later, you know, he said, I'll just have one. And he said, And then he fell, fell over tables and God knows what. And anyway, he ended up. You know, not having a quiet a couple of days. Left. <laughs> Did he just bring thirty thousand pounds into the practice well, for Arsene Wenger the next day? The beauty of the story is that is they went to Old Trafford, needed to win at Man United to win the title at their place, and did you know one one nil and Ray was man in the match, and he was called to have a, a, a interview and get given the man of the match champagne in the tunnel after the game and he was standing there. They've given him the champagne. He's just won the cup. He scored in the cup final. He's won the league. He literally has a eureka moment. This is the best moment of my life. Like he just caught, he's literally, I cannot believe it. There's a tap on the shoulder and it's Arsene and he says, Ray, I want a word with you. And he thinks, oh God, someone's going to have told him I've been drinking because sometimes people would write to the club and shop players who've been misbehaving in those days. And he thought, oh no. And, uh, he went to see Arsene and he said, Ray, I just want to say you have been unbelievable in this last, uh, in this last, uh, few, you know, few days. You were amazing at Wembley in the cup final and I, 
and you were fantastic tonight. And I didn't know you had that kind of performance in you. And you know why you played so well tonight? Because you didn't drink. As I said, because you didn't take that drink on the plane. <laughs> That's beautiful, and and I've I've seen a, a a clip from the book which I love where where he talks about I don't know, love it, but it, I think it's it's valuable. He talks about the difference in the dressing room uh, between when he was playing and when he had a brief return in 2007 to train with the club, um, and you know it's a pretty damning viewpoint that what happens off the pitch is at least as important uh, or or as important as what happens on the pitch, uh, or, or it has a lot more to do with what happens on the pitch than people realize. Um, you know, and in the 10 years since 2007, when he pretty much said the the, lock, the the dressing room wasn't talking to each other, there was no harmony in there at all, uh, and, and the play showed it, the, the dressing room was turned over completely, but I get the sense that there's probably even less harmony now in, the, in that room as ever. Um, I mean, do you get the sense that – that the that the dressing room is united, uh, fractured, or is there just maybe one or two small malcontents that may or may not be headed north in the next few days that uh, you know that that will uh, you know that'll clear up the the situation in that room. And what's your sense? You can fantasize about you know glorious uh, uh, camaraderie within a dressing room. Generally speaking, I don't think that it's anywhere it's you know absolutely glorious everywhere i think within any dressing room there's people who don't get on so well there's some people who don't talk that much um you know obviously there are it's a spectrum and some dressing rooms modern dressing rooms are going to be a lot closer to, uh, and others are going to be a lot more fractious i think the, the difficult situation is that you know whatever debates and conversations the fans are having out there let's not pretend that the players aren't having similar conversations because it would be weird if they weren't, wouldn't it? So yeah. in the same way that you have some divisions in the fan base and, and, and some people feel, okay, support whatever the cost and other people think you've got to voice your discontent and everything in between, you've probably got a bit of that going on in the dressing room as well. And, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that some of the players are thinking, you know, we're working hard here, but where are we going? Mm-hmm. Same question that we had before about are you happy with winning three FA Cups out of four or are you, um, you know, is there a bigger picture that you should be achieving more? And I think it's a, it's, a, it's probably one that those same players are wrestling with and they probably have their own different opinions as well. Um, so I think the best way to get a harmonious or as harmonious as possible addressing room is to try and have everybody believing in something. Have everybody feeling hopeful and optimistic and that, you know, we all feel we're working towards something here. We're, we're all trying to improve together. We're all, we all believe in what we're doing. And I think probably if we all look deep in our hearts and think how many of our, of the current Arsenal squad, yeah, it's probably quite hard to imagine. And most people maybe don't blame them for that because it's not the easiest moment. No, it is, and and that that led to a question that we had from Anna Lindenmeyer, who was really asking you about how to how to change the mentality of a team, and you've just given a, a, a strong suggestion on that. Uh, she also uh, wants to know what we should be, whether you feel that we should be concentrating on Premier League, uh, Europa League, League Cup, or or whether it even matters what you what you focus on from this point forward. Um, I mean. I, I read Ars blog this morning, um, and I think a lot of what he says chimes. And a lot of what feels difficult is that it's hard to really work out what this team are trying to do. Um, and until the identity of the team is how they're trying to play and what they're trying to achieve and what this team is all about becomes more obvious it's hard to see how they're going to do anything except just kind of do as much as they can in any given competition. Now, what that is, you know, is, is, is not, not looking that great in the Premier League is obviously not a situation that Arsenal can pursue in the FA Cup. The uh, only available things are the, the League Cup and the Europa League that, and a, and a potentially top four, but even the top four looks like it's going to take a, a huge upsurge in, in, in fortunes and consistency, which hasn't been the case with this team in the last while. Um, 
I, I, you know, I think that it feels like Arsenal are kind of in a bit of a limbo where it's just get on with it as best you can until the big changes happen. Perfect. So we have another last question for you, Amy, is from our uh, regular listener, Schwinn, who asks um, two questions. So the first part is, uh, what is the one quality that you believe separates Arson from other managers, past and present? And can you share a memory that you've shared with Arson that will stay with you for the rest of your life? Wow. Okay. Um, I think, apart from his humor, that pe- most people don't get to see because he's not very good at showing that in post-match interviews, which is where most people get to see Arson. Um, but his his human qualities, his faith in humanity, which sometimes is he's always <laughs> faithful. To a fault, yeah. Is a really special thing. I mean, it's a cutthroat business. It's highly competitive and it's massively pressurised. But Arsene maintains a capacity to really try and think about the human beings. Um, and there's a couple of examples I'd throw in there. I remember speaking to Edu, who was a wonderful... Oh, I miss him. Uh, (laughs) Enormously nice Brazilian midfield player who was part of the Invincibles. And when Edu joined the club, he had a really, really awful time in his personal life. Um, He lost, I think it was a sister, uh, in terrible circumstances. And it was just around the time when he was moving from Brazil to London. He had to deal with a lot of, you know, cultural change. Uh, new language, new landscape, new football, new everything. And he was in a bad place. And he didn't, and he had injuries. He had came and he arrived and he got bad injuries and he was out for a while. And he found everything quite tough. And he said every day for however long it was, I also maybe used to come up to him at the beginning of training and say, Eddie, who, how are you? How, how is your mum and dad? Are you speaking? To, you know, how is everybody? And really take that moment. To show some humanity to a guy that he knew was having a hard time um, and Edu got quite emotional when he was recalling this and it clearly meant a great great deal to him that in his time of need where he felt almost like he could cut and run or that he felt Arsenal might cut their losses Wenger was like you take all the time you need you take all the time you need. You be with your family if you need. You be here if you need. You call on us if you need. You know, and show that care to him on a daily basis. Um, Bob Wilson, who was a goalkeeping coach, who very tragically lost a daughter to cancer when when uh, it was the early days of, of Wenger's time at Arsenal, also tells similar stories of how sometimes they'd be on the bus and Arsenal would say, Bob, come and sit next to me for a bit. And he would invite him to sit on the coach next next to Arson and say, tell me, how is everything? What's going on? And sit and listen and talk and console and just be a man and be a human being. And the fact that he has, the, he doesn't boast about those things. It's not his nature, but innately, I think he wants good and sees good in people as human beings where he can. And I think that is something which is rare. And I will always value that it's it's amazing how those incredibly positive personal features and attributes have it such a double-edged sword today uh where it's those exact personal and and the the elements the loyalty uh that can come back in ways when it comes to you know footballing decisions and, and that sort of thing that 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 are ultimately leading to in in many people's eyes his demise and it's just there's such a dichotomy between arson the man and arson the 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 coach and the steward of the future for for arsenal um and that leaves us in our current situation amy how does this all end for him and for the club i don't know um i i felt for a while that you know in the in the in the end the only person that decides to close the book is arson um and I think that he is to an extent in such a bubble in his relationship with the club and to another degree ha- it has almost a fear of going outside the bubble 
you know, of not being Arsenal manager is quite a scary proposition, even though he could go and be a manager elsewhere. And he knows that he said that. Um, and he does have this kind of obsessive love for the do club. You, do you worry it's going to, do you worry it's going to end in disgrace though, when he deserves nothing like that? How do you define disgrace? I don't know. For some people, the legacy is already tarnished. Um, I, <sighs> I I just you know there are times when it gets really tough where I think oh, you almost want kind of someone to take him to one side because he's not going to do it himself you know in, in other clubs you know it would ne- it would I dare say you know have been finished before now but that decision is not the manager's the decision is someone else's but he's the one that makes the call it's a really strange situation and yeah. he's you know, 21 years of, of, of the history of this guy and his relationship with Arsenal doesn't give us any indication that he's going to walk in one day and say, the situation has got too bad, I will remove myself. Because we've had pretty rough patches before and he's never got to that stage. Yeah. So I don't see why now or a time before or a time in the future is going to necessarily be different from his perspective. I think he always believes he can turn it around. Well, I know, I know the sadness has turned to anger for many. I'm just sad, uh, conflicted. It, it, it's unfortunate because I, I don't want to feel the way that I feel sometimes. And, and, uh, and yesterday it's, it's hard not to, but, uh, we will get to yesterday, uh, in just a few moments. But Amy, I know that, that, uh, you're very busy and, and you've been more than gracious in spending an hour plus with us. Uh, we just really want to thank you for joining us and, and find out, you know, what, just one more time for for those of us in America who uh, are just going to be able to uh, to to tap into eighty nine the film tomorrow. What are the best ways for us to find it and to buy it and enjoy it and lather in it? And <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a good <laughs> in a bath full of champagne. Um... That, that, that's <laughs> yeah. That well, that's that that's that's a given. Stuff. Yeah, I, that's, that's how all of our listeners <laughs> listen to this. All of our listeners are going to be electrocuted tomorrow, but how are we going to be electrocuted specifically? It's um, it's it's available. I'm very very pleased it's going to be out in the US because I've been slightly embarrassed by um, uh, people getting in touch over these last few weeks saying, "Hey, when can we see it on the states?" And it's almost as if it's like, don't get the impression this is like, oh yeah, we're just it's like second class citizens. We're taking care of the UK oh. and Europe first, yep. and you guys will get it eventually. You're gonna cool. wave. You're gonna get a wave of feedback because I mean, <laughs> the, the people that I know that are excited to watch this film. I mean, we'll be watching it at Gunnar Gra for sure. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's going to be at every branch. Uh, it, it's it's going to be big here. But it's, down to, it's been down to kind of like film licensing and and legal stuff that I don't really understand. So it's not my choice that it's taken this bit longer to uh, to get to you. But it'll be on iTunes, on Amazon, uh, on kind of usual dvd and download buying channels uh as far as i know anyway so um i hope that if you get half as much fun watching it as we did making it then you're in for a not bad night well, and we better win i have to say <laughs> we better win so amy thank <laughs> on that note thank you so much for joining us we appreciate your time we hope to speak to you again someday and yeah, it's been a pleasure and and uh, we just we enjoy your work and look forward to reading and and watching more of it. Thanks so much. All right, cheers, Amy. Mike, that was great. Uh, we want to say thank you again to Amy uh, for coming on. And we're kind of recording this a little bit in in segments. Um, so now Mike and I are going to jump into the two fixtures that we've had since our last pod. Um, Mike, Chelsea away uh, semi final. I know we're not going to cover. It I feel too like much. it's half over. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, let, let's let's shove too much uh, breakdown about this until after the, the tie is over. Uh, I guess it's a week and a half from now. Um, it, it's I, I look at it as being halftime of a dreadfully unentertaining semifinal. I mean, the the contrast between the league game against Chelsea and then this game is just crazy. How those could have been the same football clubs playing each other. Uh, you know, two weeks apart or a week apart, but, uh, not the prettiest of games. I, f- I was left feeling very, very unsatisfied with our performance, yet <laughs> a nil-nil at the bridge in the first leg of a two-leg, uh, semifinal. I mean, all we got to do now is win at home. Yeah. Any win will do. You know, I thought the same thing, but my concern is we've played Chelsea twice. 
we've probably outplayed them over the course of the 180 minutes. But we've Played given three, three times now. Well, I mean, in recent in the last two matches, and so we've outplayed them, but we've given them the opportunity to grab the match. And I don't know if this third time in three weeks is going to be the, the, the nail in the coffin where they take those chances. Um, and so I mean, the pure numbers game with Murata, I mean, he's got to hit one eventually. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we keep giving uh, him those chances. Yeah. So fingers crossed that we can, we can at least, at least reach a final. Um, let's head over to Bournemouth because mm, we have to, we have to, um, that's what we're paid to do. <sighs> so we're in a unique situation because we weirdly knew someone who knew someone that was staying at the team hotel. <laughs> so the night before, uh, they obviously saw the players get off a bus or were walking the hallways, and we knew Sanchez and Rosal weren't I, in the squad. I saw an online source that broke that news. Yeah. I, I'm not going to say who it was. But, but um, so it wasn't really a surprise for us to see that, that Sanchez wasn't in the squad you know, Mike, if this is the squad without Sanchez and Ozil, we fucked. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> without beating the dead horse of Alexi Sanchez and putting him in the lineup, not putting him in, we see with Payet at West Ham when he finally left, it seemed like for West Ham there was a, a like a month period where they played better football, there were players on the pitch that became a little bit more expressive with their play, which ultimately led to them looking like a better team. It felt like their manager was a little bit uh, easier in press conferences because he didn't get asked that same question over and over again. And I think it gave opportunity for certain players to get playing time and, and, and try and cement their stamp on the team. Do you feel like Sanchez walking away – I don't want to say he's a cancer in the dressing room because I don't think he is. But do you think it's just well, time now to say, know. "Hey, get out of here," you know, and and allow this team to just move forward? Yeah, I mean, it, it is time to say get out of here. I mean, there, there's no coming back from this. Um, it, if it could have gotten any more uh, fractured in the last few days than it already was, it has gone. It has become. I mean, it's just. You know, again, we really don't know what's going on in there, but when there's smoke, there's fire. This is broken. He's not coming back. He's, his mind is not with this team, so it's time to get him out. Um, the West Ham thing is funny because I remember talking on the podcast last year about the West Ham bump when we were doing our predictions, mm -hmm. and then I look back at it today, and, and uh, after they sold him, after they finally sold him, I mean, they won a couple games, I think, after before they sold him because they weren't they they had frozen him out and made him yeah. train by himself. But after they sold him, they won four out of their last 16 games. So, I, I mean, if that's the standard that we're looking for, I think we well, can – we might be able to win five. I th no, um, I, like I said, at the level of West Ham. But I think those yeah. four games were probably in quick succession after Payet left. Now, um, let's go to the match itself. So this this 11 was probably the best 11 that we have without Ozil and Sanchez. Um oh. Hector gave us the lead when he latched on to a defense-splitting pass from Alex Awobi. Squeezed the ball past Asmir Begovic. It was a great finish. It was a, you know, for as much as we hate on the guy, I thought Awobi started the match pretty well. And, and that pass was absolutely sublime. Um, so credit where credit's due. And, and you jinxed us, Mike, because I saw before the match or just before the goal, <laughs> you started talking shit about Ballarat and then he scores, which you love to do. So it, I encourage you to do it, it was, every match about every player, including the goalie. It was two minutes before the goal. I, I re and, and it's not a jinx. It's a reverse jinx. And it's, it's very, very intentional. You know, you, you know that three weeks ago during the Liverpool game, we were chatting in WhatsApp with, with the boys about how poor Xhaka had been and that he needed to be pulled out of the game. And two minutes later, you know, boom, he scores a screamer. And then, like, five minutes after that, not even five minutes after that, we tested it out again. I, I falsely screamed for them to take Ozil out of the game just to see if it worked. And he scores the, 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 he scored the beauty. Yeah, and you don't want to go back to the well too often, but today, or yesterday, I composed a very thoughtful tweet about how obvious it was that Bellerin just needed to be pulled the heck out of the game. You know, that, that one thunderstrike against Chelsea doesn't mean that he's fit to be in the squad. Uh, 
two minutes later, boom. Uh, I don't know if you could call that goal boom, but, uh, but yeah, Wobie's sublime through ball and Bellerin's laser finish that deflected off of the goalie and, and, and rolled over the, uh, the finish line. To me, we're just about the only two positive moments of the game for either one of them. I mean, I, I don't share that Awobi was really that strong at the beginning of the game. I thought he was awful from the off, uh, and that Bellerin was just horrific for the entire game with the exception of that one run, uh, and the one finish. And, and, um, but I mean, he, he's, you know, he's got, he's got the goals two and two. Um, it's just crazy though, because last season I was singing his praises in October as being one of the best young right backs in the world. I slapped a price tag on him that I, I cannot even bring myself to say right now because it's so ridiculous. And um, then he got hurt in the North London Derby in November, and, and you know, we thought the second half decline was due to the injury, but I have no clue what's going on he with him this the, He is one of the best right backs in the world, Mike. He's just not having a good season. Huh? And, and, and you, you, you don't just fall Season off. and a half. You, but yeah, but you just don't fall off. Look at this team. It's not like the team's playing really well and Bellerin is losing us matches by, him, by himself. Wilson took advantage of Petr Cech's indecision uh, as he got to Ryan Frazier's low cross. The key, I don't know what the hell Cech was doing. A- as a keeper, there's no thought that runs through my mind thinking you should go for that ball. I mean, y- y- they always say, Mike, as a goalie, when the ball's in your 18, you start to play for it. When the ball is in your 6, it's your ball. That ball was nowhere near his 6. He's got two defenders in front of him that are able to challenge. I think he's better off just closing the angle of the goal and and hopefully if uh, Frazier does break through those two defenders, he looks up and sees a big body in front of him and, and I, checks to blame. I mean, absolutely poor defending and excuse me, poor goalkeeping. Um, I just I don't understand how the hell you allow a player to do that. And and there was other breakdown on the play, but uh, oh, yeah. for I mean, me, he has t- checks the blame. <laughs> he has two defenders to clear the ball. He's got four more guys, defenders and midfielders, all crowded within two yards of, of Frazier, you know, who himself is within two yards from the sideline. Uh, I, I tweeted a picture of it. I mean, I, I could not believe it. I was watching it with my son, and I, I felt like I had to tell him, this is what you don't do. And he's like, yeah, Dad, I learned that like six years ago. <laughs> uh, I mean, it looked like a two on none crossing drill that you'd see in a practice, except there's six Arsenal players standing around with their dicks in their hand. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not the guy to talk about tactical analysis. So when I recognize that something's wrong, it's pretty damning. Um, you know, I, I've seen his coaches yelling at him, my son, that is, since they were eight. And that's just well, the, defensive coaching. The frustrating was, thing about it was on the it bench is, at the time. Yeah, is um, you know you'll never see that with a Conte Mourinho type of type of team. Um, and if you did, someone would have gotten the, the hook immediately. So it's one one. Uh, then Lewis Cook crosses to rifle home and take a two one lead. Mike, even at one one, I couldn't see us getting back into this match, let alone going down two one. Uh, I thought Lacazette was missing. Uh, Welbs was missing. Chambers, surprisingly, was having a, a, a decent game. Um, and it felt like it just all fell apart after he was subbed. I mean, if this is our team going forward, we're in a lot of trouble. A lot yeah. of trouble. And, and and I don't care if you're Kroenke, if you're Gazidis, if you're Arson, you, you have to see how poor this team is. There's no spark. There's no fire. And when we tried to add a spark, he was offside twice. That was his <sighs> that was his contribution to the game, two offsides. Yeah. Um he was not good. Uh he no one is was not good, good, but his price tag went from twenty two million to like a couple crunchy bars, uh I think in that game. I mean what is Everton thinking? Uh but Please, long may they think that until the deal is done. But the, the goal came within 30 seconds, I believe, of Chambers being subbed out. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not proclaiming that Chambers is the Messiah. I thought he was pretty poor uh, and not deserving of his place the last couple games. You just never know who's going to show up one week to the next. Because I do think Chambers was one of, you know, Chambers, Maitland, Niles, and Jack, I think, are the only three guys that showed up for that game uh, yesterday. Yep. Um, and, you know, you're starting to see some regularity from, from Maitland, Niles, and from Jack. Thank goodness. Uh, but as it 
stands for everybody else on the pitch, you're going to get one or two random people who show up and about six or seven who are just dog shit. And I, I, I just, I don't get it. it. And, and we hear a lot of talk and we may get to it. I hate, I hate transfer talk, uh, that's not finished yet, but I mean, we may get to it, but we hear a lot of new people coming in, but it's going to take time for anybody new to bet in, especially if they're not, uh, already, uh, experienced in the Premier League, which is why I don't know where, you know, the Mares thing is going. It seems to not be going anywhere. But, uh, I mean, we're, we're in for a lean couple months, I feel. And of course, as soon as I say that, we'll rattle off like 10 straight wins. But, um, you well, know, so let me say it, let me say it again. We, we, we have to go there. I mean, we have to go transfer. I mean, by the time this pods out, which is going to be in an hour, a lot can have happened. Um, but let's go straight yeah. to Sanchez because I felt like in Arson's post game comments, I read the Sanchez situation as up until now, <laughs> meaning in the last couple days, Sanchez has thrown the toys out of the pram. I think that there's been something that's happened. That's how I interpreted the comments made around Sanchez. Um, I don't know if it was a case of all of a sudden United have come in with this great offer and things are on the table. And I, I'm speaking as Arson. It sounded like he was saying, I'm giving Sanchez the opportunity to figure out what he wants to do with the next step in his career. And that happens to fall within 48 hours of us having a match. Or is it... Um, dudes said, hey, United have come after me, and toys out of the pram, I want to go, I don't want to be here, and, and Arson thought, well, we're in within 48 hours of a match, I don't want to deal with this. I mean, how did you interpret those comments around Sanchez? Naive and kind of clueless to an extent. Uh, I mean, he can say that he was settled and, and you know until this one game, but I, I just don't see how that could possibly be the Something's case. Something's unsettled him, right? Well, something has accelerated within the last week or so, and those are those are you know bids coming in, and 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 who knows whether he is you know whether he's showing up for training. I have no reason to think he isn't. Whether he would have played if uh, if Wenger had had let him, or whether he would have sat out. I mean, it, it to me, you almost smell like like there was a dispute that was about to happen and arson had to get out in front of it and make it seem like it was his decision mm -hmm. uh to you know to avoid having somebody out there whose mind wasn't fully with it but let's just roll back the clock four months ago five months ago and think about what he did with alex oxley chamberlain when he knew full well that Cham i mean he didn't find out after the liverpool match that Chamberlain wanted to go he knew that beforehand and played chamber to try to keep him so why didn't he do the same thing with Sanchez yesterday? I'm not saying he should have, but you know, compare those two situations. There's a difference. Well, and, there's a difference and I think the in difference caliber of the difference, player too. The, well, there certainly is, but there's a difference in I think what uh, what Alexis may have been ready to uh, not bring to the table over the weekend um, that that led to that. I, you know, the whole thing stinks to high heaven, and the sooner that Alexis gets out of here, the better. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not. That doesn't mean I blame Alexis 100%. That just means I, I think we're, you know, we're screwed with him and we're screwed without him. So let's at least try to get some some harmony in the locker room so that everybody knows that the people that are in there are, are committed to the team going forward. And that doesn't ex that doesn't excuse Ozil either, because he, you know, he gets a pass in a lot of cases. But I mean. As far as I know, his his knee was all right. <laughs> Where well, was he yesterday? Yeah, it's all hearsay whether he was okay or not. What what frustrates me with I, the I Sanchez, talked to his What frustrates me with the Sanchez situation is, you know, we hear Manchester City quite often and quite a lot, and and I was one that was super hopeful that wouldn't happen because City are absolutely the best team in the league. I think if Sanchez joins them, they're going to be one of the best teams in the world. Um, uh, for me, when Sanchez goes to City, the the reason he goes there is to be partnered with Pep again. But he's also going because he knows that they are going to compete at least on three cup levels. Okay, now we start seeing the United talk, and we start seeing the money banded around. And the only reason Sanchez goes there at this point is for the money because they're not going to challenge for the league. 
I don't think they're going to do mo- do well in, in, in Europe. And so you start looking at Sanchez and you start thinking, you slimy motherfucker, because it, this is clearly about money now. Whereas when it's City, you're thinking, okay, you're going to get paid, but you're also going to be competing. Um, so for me, Mike, and I'm going to ask you the same question, if you have a choice between the two, <laughs> where would you rather he go with the caveat that we keep hearing that United players might be part of this exchange. I personally, at this point, would rather he go to United for two reasons. First, if it brings a player back in our direction, great, because I don't trust our management to actually bring in players to replace Sanchez. I don't believe the Aubameyang will get to that. But I think that if we can bring a player with like a Mkhitaryan, who's a great player when he's healthy, at least it brings another body to our club and adds depth to a club that where we desperately need it. If we're super smart, I'd love to bring a Chris Smalling, who I know isn't that great of a defender, but compared to what we have and how weak we are in that position, at least bring someone in. Um, so that's my choice. Um, and also, second point to that, Mike, sorry I'm rambling, Jose Mourinho will fuck this up. Somehow, <laughs> See, that's, that's, some way, that's, that's, he will fuck this up. Too. And And... If you bring in Sanchez, you basically destroy Rashford's career. And as an Englishman, I hate to say that, but when you're Arsenal and you sit back and you see that, maybe you can snatch up Rashford in a season or two. So that's why I think he should go to United, uh, because I do think for those two reasons, I'm pushing that agenda rather than seeing him go to City. Yeah, and a lot of people from, you know, we've been getting a lot of opinions from friends and reading off of Twitter and, and, you know, it's all, uh, the longer term Arsenal supporter you are, the more you, you're saying, you know, you, after the RVP situation, you know, Vendor lied if, if he sells him to United. He, uh, you know, City's already won the league. And I've said this, you know, him going to City when I assumed it was the only option. You know, I, I'm like, they're, they're not going to win the league, you know, more over us than they otherwise would. It doesn't matter if they win it by more points. So just send him there and, you know, if he's going to go there over the summer anyway, um, then fuck it. But, uh, you know, you, to me, you're absolutely right about the fact that, you know, you're, you're strengthening City for years by sending him there. Um, United has that aura now of just being a very delicately balanced situation as far as mentality and coach and, and and I agree with you. I think if he goes there he unsettles whatever harmony they have in that in that dressing room. Um and you know it it seems like there's a lot further to fall for them by having an off the pitch unsettling than by adding an on the pitch superstar and and you know and the thing is, you've got Mourinho, who is an awful manager of men. I mean, he, he look, he, he wins stuff, but he destroys it as well. And it looks like, you know, in this case, he may just be skipping the winning stuff year, which is supposed to be this year for him. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it unsettles the situation. I think it it, it knocks a couple people down, the, uh, down the, the pecking order there that were just finally getting a chance. And... And, you know, Mourinho will be out of there in a year, and Alex will be too old to really contribute too much. I mean, he won't be too old in a year, but I, I'm with you. Sell him to, uh, sell him to United. Um, if we get a player back, which I, I don't recall the last time that has happened, uh, there have been players who switch teams from each other over the summer, but there's never been like a direct player swap in a long, long time that I can remember. So I don't buy it. I think they're just going to pay the money. Uh, they'll pay more than City's going to. They'll pay Alexis a lot more than City was going to. Um, so, you know, uh, that would be my preference. How's that for a quick answer? No, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, we, we've talked a lot about, about Sanchez and, and I think that now. That I can't wait to stop. Yeah, I can't either. I really can't either. One thing that we do know, um, is that there's been a lot of smoke around Aubameyang. I don't know if it's if it's accurate or not. For me personally, I think he would be a and as I said before, I think he would be a great addition to our squad because he's already going to be a player that can come in and he's almost a like for like replacement with Sanchez. But he is is, is he though? No, he, he's an out and out striker. Well, I was about to say before you rudely interrupted that. me that. <laughs> He's an out-and-out replacement for Sanchez at the level of ability. He can come in, he can make a difference, he can change a match. However, he's purely a number nine. We already have a number nine. 
I don't trust that Arson would change our formation. So what do we do with him? Why It doesn't make sense. This is just a transfer that doesn't make sense. And well, it's another thing that, that I mean, if you're, if you're uh, Lacazette right now, I mean, how, did, is this how you fit, pictured your first year going? I mean, you're just getting <laughs> jerked around. I mean, look, even if there's nothing to this Aubameyang thing, you know, he's got to be wondering. He, he's wondering why is why is Hector Bellerin following him on Twitter this morning, which was the big thing. Uh, all and the time. Bellerin's trolling. Yeah, they, they, days. they apparently <laughs> they apparently follow each other like four hours ago, and you know, but. I don't know how much stuff like that gets under lock is that skin, but uh, if I'm Alex Zong, uh I'm starting to wonder what the fuck is going on here. Right. Um, you know, this is like I came here to basically be the final piece in something, and and now everyone's bailing, and they're talking about people to replace me entirely rather than just in the 70th minute because Obama Yang isn't coming here to to, to be the plan B. If he's coming here. Uh, so unless Arson pulls a major surprise out of his ass and, and changes formation completely to play with two strikers, um, you know, I don't really know what he has in mind because Aubameyang's big jump went was he was moved from the wing to the number nine, if I remember correctly. And frankly, that when we were first rumored with him at like 30 or 35 million, that is when we should have moved on him. Right. No, now no. he's. Now he's another potential Alexis Sanchez type or, or, you know, the type of guy that, uh, you know, can unsettle your team, uh, as talented as he is. So I, I, I covet the guy for name value. I covet him for the, the, what he's capable of on the pitch. I've loved him for the last few years. Uh, but he makes me a little bit more nervous than, than say Malcolm, who you're right. He could end up, uh, being subject to heightened expectations. But he's younger and seems to have a lot more, you know, more potential and fit into our current formation. Yeah, and maybe uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot. Although of the names. person that seems to make the most sense there is Mares or Draxler, um, but um, yeah. I don't think either of those two players are going to make a move. I think it, we we would have done that business already. Now the Mares situation maybe becomes a little bit more interesting if Theo does move in the window. Because people are banding Malcolm as being that replacement for Alexis, but if you lose Theo, then you do need to bring in another attacking player. Um, and if, so, if we don't sell Theo in this window, are we going to have like a, a joint suicide podcast oh, uh, God, at I mean, the end of January? I mean, I, I might just not come back from Gunagra. I think a lot of people would take the <laughs> would drink the Kool Aid. Oh, so one transfer that we do what know is. Uh, is what are you saying? What? You're like, sound like a robot right now. Well, you, so we obviously have internet problems, but, uh, but let's plug on. One transfer. You're going to talk about, you're going to talk about cock? Yes. One transfer we do know that is gone. Um, the cock has exploded and he landed in, uh, Valencia. It, it it's a year and a half late, man. I mean, the guy was never good enough. Um, I, I made a comment on Twitter that you didn't really see anyone upset that Coughlin left because of his footballing ability. A lot of people were upset that he left because he loved Arsenal and was passionate when he wore the shirt. But no one was actually upset because of his footballing ability. No, I mean, especially the way he was being utilized over the last couple of years. I mean, his football ability when he first came back from Charlton was was exceptional. Um, and I feel like it could still be exceptional if, if that was still the way he was being utilized. But given that it's not, you know, I mean, uh, I, I would have preferred that he broke his duck before he left here. I'm surprised he didn't get a brace yesterday in his debut, but... Um, you know, so now I got to move on to Maitland Niles, uh, on the duck watch, but you know, I, I like Coughlin as a, as a, as a player. I mean, again, we're, we're selling the heart and soul of our team, but, um, we need heart and soul that can actually play. Mm -hmm. And I, and so I hope that we replace him, uh, and upgrade, uh, in a way that isn't just, well, we've got El Nenny. Um, yeah, I'd like to see a new name come in there. Obviously, it won't be in, Jan in January, but this summer, I mean, there's like Amy said, there's got to be something that happens in that in that department. There, there does. Shock, but we've, been, not we've been saying that Mike for four years. 
we've been saying how we need to build and, and, and add depth to our defensive midfielder, but we don't play with one, and we never will as Arsene's the manager. Um, I am a little concerned with the lack of depth in that position because you almost have nobody if Jack and Aaron go out. Um, well, it'll, it'll be Maitland-Niles, hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, and, 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 but then you've got to have your wingbacks healthy. Exactly. I mean, you've got to have Nacho and Kalasnic back and, and ready to go. Um, but we are short. We have a lot of injuries right now. Um, but I don't, I don't think that this team is just – there's something wrong, man. And, and I, again, I think it stems from top down. I think that the dressing room has been lost. I don't think that there's any player on this team – that is capable of making the big impact um, to change and turn things around. Yeah, see, I don't look at it as a dressing room loss situation a la Chelsea when Mourinho, you know, had them down in, you know, near relegation spots. I look at it as a dressing room that's lost faith and and is not inspired. They're not rebelling. They're not rebelling. Right. They're not rebelling like they were against, uh, like Lester did apparently against, um, uh, the guy that won them the title the following year. I mean, whose name is the, the right, Tinker yeah, Man. Right. Yeah, Rainier. I mean, the, it, it's not that kind of thing. It's almost worse because there's no fire. They're just, they're just dead inside. And, and I think, you know, and, and, you know, again, we go back and forth on this Klopp thing, you know, and, and it's so easy to point to, to Klopp as being the master and then they go through a rough spell and everyone's like, well, he's not that great. You know, you can't argue with the fire and the inspiration that he had, that, that he's got his players listening to right now. Um, and whether his players are good enough to, to, you know, to make it into a Premier League run or not, who knows, but they certainly buy into it. And that is the opposite of what's going on here. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we don't have the fire. The, and and it sounds like if someone wanted to bring the fire on the coaching staff, they wouldn't be allowed to. Um, and so I think it's going to be a miserable three to four months to close out the season. Um, and you asked Amy the question of where does our focus lie, and I think it has to be in Europa. I mean, I, I think we have to go into Premier League matches with the thought of, you know, obviously three points is a must, but our best route into the Champions League is winning Europa. Um, speaking of Jurgen Klopp, yesterday he uh, gets <laughs> the win to to secure the invincible season lives on. Mike, I just want to say that, you know, as much shit as we give Arson, it's an absolute genius plan for him to sell Chamberlain to <laughs> Liverpool to make sure that their season uh, gets uh, gets that L. Um, but it, I mean, the, the, the amount of forethought into doing that, like, five months beforehand and letting him get all of his bad games out of the way and his his behind-the-scenes interviews for the club TV channel out of the way, and then come in with, you know, with his first fantastic performance to uh, to preserve the, you know, I, you, you do have to hand it to him. I mean, it was genius. I think Dick Law might have had something to do with that. Yeah, right. At the end of the day, we're we're going to start seeing Chamberlain play for Liverpool in a role that highlights his, his determination and how good of a player he is, and I think... Yeah, really, probably. Mike, I really do think that we're going to look back on that sale and think, fuck, if we had a manager who could have actually primed him and not played him in every single position on the pitch. Um, so we're in a weird situation, Mike, because things are happening at the club. There's going to be ins, there's going to be outs, and, and we're not completely sure of, of what those are, but um, it's kind of a jacked up situation right now. Well, it'll make for good uh, good narrative over the next few weeks. I just wish it wasn't the case, but there's plenty to talk about. I uh, I just don't know that I can take any more of talking about it right now because would, it's, would there's, you, there's so um, much left to be seen. Well, yeah, and, and, and so without speculation, do you feel like um, – do you think we'll bring in one or two players this January? I think we'll bring in – well – in addition to the one we brought in, I think we'll bring in one more. Um, I think, I think there's some smoke to the fire of the whole Malcolm thing. Um, I don't buy the Obama Yang thing. I, I don't know why. Uh, it's just, it's just so just out of left field. Um, and, um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know why it makes I, sense in the press, Mike? Because they get clicks. 
Well, well, no, it's not that. It, 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 well, yeah, it, it is because it gets clicks, but it, it makes sense to bring up that story because we've hired the guy who founded Aubameyang and brought him to Dortmund, and now there's founded him. Well, he did. I mean, he he cre- he he brings him to Dortmund, and, and Dortmund expose him for the player that he is. That's why it makes sense, you know. And then on top of that, you're getting clicks, but. I don't personally feel like we are going to bring in players, so I adhere to the if we are going to sell Sanchez and there are players on the table, I prefer him to go to uh, yeah. United. And think about all the offside goals we're going to get to talk about, Mike, <laughs> if we bring Mkhitaryan to Arsenal. Yeah, don't sell Giroud because I don't think there's ever been a team before that has had two Scorpions on the team at the same time, offside or otherwise. Because as soon as we, if if Mkhitaryan does come to our team, that goal becomes onside. Oh, and because it's uh, the only goal that we're we'll, ever going to watch because the two yeah, of them are just we'll, going to keep trying to one up each other. And, and for, you know what? If that's what we can like look forward to, Mike, I'm okay with it. It's going to be gymnastics. There could be judges, the Russian judge on the sideline scoring the, the, the level of the bicycle kick instead of just the fact that it's a bicycle kick. So, so here we found a way of, of, of slapping a positive spin on our current situation. And then next week it'll all be destroyed. So we always do. We always do. Quite a pod. Amy, uh, in your absence, we just want to thank you so much for coming on again. Uh, I, I am uh, at some point tomorrow going to crawl into a corner and just watch that and just. Wish it was 1989 all over again, which I don't think will make my family very happy. But but uh, but I I can't wait to see the movie and and uh, good chat today. Things are not great around the Arsenal, but this podcast we will always try to make the best of it. Hey, right? Yes, and now 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 uh, as of today, there are um, pictures of Malcolm at his photo shoot. <laughs> so someone's photoshopped his body and an Arsenal uh, kit. The amount of shit we go through as as fads, I just I love it. Yeah, and we love ITKs. They they are uh, they're just our lifeblood. We 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 thrive off of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, rodents! All right. Well, it's been a good week. Please uh, listen to us. Review us on iTunes. Uh, give us a thumbs up um, if iTunes has that function, or on SoundCloud or whatever the hell how we get things out to our people. I don't even know. Carrier pigeon. Um, and uh, make sure to, if, if you're in the U.S., uh, make sure to watch 89 the film. If you're in the U.K. and you haven't seen it yet, come to the U.S. and watch it with me. And um, that's about it. Have a great week, Andy. Thanks. You Talk too, to Mike. you next weekend and come on, you Gooners. <laughs>